thank you very much for doing this. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, your art's awesome. You're a huge inspiration. And uh, I read a little bit of your, your backstory, and uh, it sounds pretty amazing. It sounds like a, basically the true artistic journey. So you want to tell me a little bit about uh, what brought you here? Oh, boy. <laughs> like, go way back. i got to dial the, the clock back, Dan. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, first I was born. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, I jokingly state that I must, I, I've been drawing, I, I can't even remember when I started drawing. You know, my parents have, uh, I, I, I have some drawings from my first grade class. So I was six, seven years old and I've got, I was drawing incessantly then. So okay. I figure if you'd probably go all the way back, I left cave paintings in my mother's womb for my brother, my younger brother to see a couple, two years later when, when he was born. <laughs> so it's like, I, I've been drawing ever since I was, I could, I think since I could lift a pencil, lift a crayon. And, and were you always yeah. into the sci-fi kind of fancy stuff that you mainly do nowadays? Uh, kind of, I mean, not, not, not obviously when I was really young, Oh, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but I, I wasn't really exposed to science fiction per se until the movies really started hitting, like Star Wars. Uh, okay, and I, I still remember like that was that was a big break open kind of movie, which threw me into the world of science fiction. And okay, what well, the early Star Wars? What what's that? The, the early Star Wars was that what? Yeah. Kind of yeah, the movie, boundary. yeah, 1977, yeah, I, I first saw it in the drive-in theater, so I had that that crappy little speaker that they hang on the window, and, and that's the, the, all the sound comes, you know, no Dolby surround, no, no, it's just. No, it wasn't through the uh, the car audio, you that's know, right. speakers, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, so that was, uh, but, but part of, I think, the reason why I just kind of glommed on to Star Wars so much was uh, before that I was my parents used to get me a lot of model kits uh, World War II model kits uh, contemporary models so jet fighters tanks uh, battleships and that's I mean that's kind of how I consumed my time was was making these things you know m models with like a thousand pieces to them do you still have any of those yeah, luckily I do have just a couple. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't survive my late teenage years where everything <laughs> explodes with, with firecrackers. And, right, right. Yeah, and fire. So, yeah, uh, I said, yeah, I chose to put firecrackers in them and have them like blow up. And well, yeah. yeah, exactly. It was just like, you know, every, everything got blown up when, when, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the middle teen years when I discovered fireworks, you know, <laughs> so unfortunately, but luckily a few did survive. You know, I, I did keep a few. Uh, so those, those are still in, back here in the studio. Uh, but, but I think that's what I wanted to say is that uh, the whole epicness of Star Wars, the vehicle, the, the fascination with vehicles and things. Uh, it was like again, again, even Lucas used World War II footage for the dog fights. And, right. Well, I know he yeah. used a lot of like uh, myths and everything, and tried to incorporate a bunch of stuff. It was the first time I saw a sci-fi that wasn't like just one story about something weird. Like it yeah. actually seemed to have a whole universe and like it, a lot of stuff interacting. I love that. Was it kind of like that for you? Like with yeah, all, you know, that? You know, yeah. There's there, there's that implied history, right? That yeah, yeah. Eight, you know, things were beat up, things were aged, uh, and that's that aesthetic was really, you know, again, it just you're right. It felt like a plausible world that humans could live in, right? Right. And, um. So yeah. So certainly, I was start. I was at that time was also starting to watch the Star Trek reruns right. on TV. Uh, you know, the originals from the '60s. So. So a lot, you know, there's obviously a lot of factors that come into play, but yeah, like I quickly glommed on to science fiction and fantasy films and and comics, uh, all and just ran, you know, like that that consumed my my early adulthood com completely. Did you have like a favorite um, series of comic books or series of books or series of movies aside from oh. Star Wars? Oh, geez, uh, well, for comics, certainly, uh, I. 
one of the first regular monthlies that I picked up was Conan the Barbarian. Okay. Uh, yeah, John John Buscema was you know the brilliant penciler uh, at the time, and I just you know loved his Conan. Uh, no, I remember stuff. Well, Barry Winston Smith, who did Conan later on, and went yeah. on to do a bunch of other stuff. He's amazing. I, I love his stuff. Yeah, that hell yeah. inspired me. So, did yeah, your parents that, encourage your artistic uh, ambitions? Oh, uh, what well, it certainly. Well, I don't know if encouraged. What you mean like encouraged me to draw and things, or uh, I think it certainly inspired me to tell stories. But I didn't really. Uh, you know, comics are like it's you know anyone who does comics, it's a, it's a whole nother skill set, right? Uh, right. I mean, being able to draw anatomy, uh, figures, all kinds of basically everything out of your head. You know, after obviously doing research, but uh, as a young artist, I couldn't do that, but I could emulate a little bit of it. So that's so my some of my first early works in my call co not college, but high school level years was copying and emulating. Uh, comic what illustrator. would that be around an era like oh, what years? Uh, i guess it was like mid early 80s so like 1980 to 85 was my heavy comic book consumption era you know i i, I collected everything you know iron man uh swamp thing uh you know super you know superman batman uh daredevil uh geez, legion of superheroes uh Thor with the you know, Walt Simonson, you know, George Perez doing the Teen Titans. Yeah, he was, uh, uh, I interviewed him a little while ago, Walt Simonson, he was a huge influence. Like, it, it seemed like that was uh, one of the first times where comics really, they weren't just like little, you know, drawings. They, they seemed to jump off the page. They seemed to really tell a story. I know he read a bunch into that, you know, like he, he read a bunch of the, the myths and so on and tried to incorporate all that into it. So it wasn't just like some guy with the cape running around. It was actually an evolved landscape. Well, the, yeah, the, I think that there was certainly the 80s saw that, right? Saw a, a change in storytelling for the superhero characters. Right. Um, well, I, I wanted to be a comic artist. And I remember Alan Moore with like Watchmen and like those oh, right. things and stuff yep. like that. That really broke boundaries for me. I was like, "Wow, this actually seems like uh like an avenue that, that I could express myself in." Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Alan Moore, like, yeah, Swamp Thing was like a psychedelic trip. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like talk about and it was it was it was a mainstream DC comic too, right? And so it was like. It was well, like, here's whoa. the funny thing. It's like, you know, yeah. it was about to be canceled. It was just when, oh, really? it, like, before yeah. Alan Moore came on board, it was like one issue away from being canceled. And they just kind of lucked out. They're like, well, we have this guy, Alan Moore. He seems to be a big deal in the UK. And they got this amazing art team. They went to school at, uh, they went to school in Jersey at a pretty famous school. It was a Kubert School of Design. And uh, yeah. he just lucked out and he had like the best team. It was the best story. And they kind of let him get away with everything because it was about to be canceled. They're like, what do we have oh, to lose? Wow. So that's why it was so. Yeah. I remember Steve Bissett was one of the illustrators. And uh, is it Veach? Uh, was Rick one Veach. The yeah. Yeah. I, I interviewed Steve Bissett too. And uh, it was pretty much like he said when he looked at the comic page, he just wanted to destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> so when he looked at it, like, that's why everything was like, it's bursting it off. They don't have traditional panels. Yeah, yeah, like everything that. was yeah. fractured, right? It was, that's, what, that's what I mean by it was like a psychedelic trip. And that's what I, I loved it. I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. Because I also loved the panels narration, you know, that like Frank Miller was doing with Daredevil. Oh, yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think he was an awesome writer, too. Yeah. You know, especially when we got to um, like The Dark Knight and stuff like that, he really broke out. Oh, right. That yeah, was another thing where you lucked out, like, just the writer quit or was about to quit, and they're like, well, you know, why don't you try it? He was like, job done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, so comics, yeah, comics are a huge influence on what I, you know, who I am as a as an artist to this to this day. I still, you know, think, you know, uh, you know in terms of, like, laying out panels, camera eye, you know, I, I just kind of like go to the idea of comics as a, a solution. Uh, yeah, for stuff has real dynamism, real sense of motion, like, you yeah. know, yeah. like odd angles and everything that right. like makes you seem more alive. Yeah. I know a lot of people, when they see your work, they're like, it looked kind of like the old masters, but it's doing like fantasy and sci-fi stuff, which a lot of people loved. Obviously, a lot of people love because you seem to be a very in-demand illustrator. 
Well, if I, if that's part of. I think that uh, the I, I'm a uh, like a mimic. Uh, I like to like absorb pe- people's style, you know, like approaches. Uh, not so much styles, but just an aesthetic approach. So, like, I, I love like taking, yeah, sucking in the comic book illustrators and taking traditional realism from classical, you know, like rendering and storytelling, and you know, and blend that together, and, and then spit it out with science fiction and fantasy as the uh, kind of the veneer of the content. So it's then uh, you um, where, where were you? You went to art school and you were born somewhere else, and you moved to New York City. Is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, I was born up in Vermont and went to college first at the kind of the local school, the University of Vermont. And but then eventually I found my way, uh, found a place at Syracuse University for the art training. Uh, and it was there that I was exposed to a lot of great professional illustrators and artists, visiting artists that were coming up from New York City and also getting really great training. Uh, as And I actually was trained not as like a storyteller illustrator, but as a fine artist painter. And right. yeah. So I took a lot of that aesthetic, you know, deconstruction, you know, analyzing narrative, uh, breaking it down. And again, that's why I love like Steve Bissett. Look, you know, looking back, even before I had this kind of training, I was, you know, responding positively to these, you know, pushing the limits kind of uh, illustrators. So yeah. Do you have in mind doing like uh, anything specific, like book covers or you know movie uh, posters kind, or anything like that? Kind of. Actually, I had in mind to be a comic book illustrator. <laughs> <laughs> if you actually like, if you like, I don't have like, I actually probably could run over and get something. Uh, but like, we, I was part of a comic book club at Syracuse University, and so we, also, did that still survive? Can people still see your illustrations anywhere? Yeah, you know, like I think they're right here. Like, hold on a second, let me go grab them. I'll be okay. right back. Like, take me twenty seconds. Okay, here we are. <laughs> so these were comics that we were publishing uh, at Syracuse University as students, with the funding from our uh, was it the student council money? You know, basically your student association money. And uh, this is a cover that I I helped pencil on the background. And I collaborated with two other artists, uh, Steve Ellis and Ryan Dunlavy, who are both now professional illustrators, uh, comic artists as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome, and, uh, man. Yeah, and then uh, let's see. Then Steve and I, Steve Ellis and I collaborated on my final year at Syracuse, and we did this story, this stuff here. Let me get this up high enough. In, yeah. Yeah, no, awesome, man. Yeah, so this is this is yeah, so this is this is the stuff that I was doing my uh, final year at Syracuse, totally inspired by oh, uh, like Jeff Darrow's Hard Boiled and Akira. Uh, mm-hmm. Both I love. Yeah, I love yeah. Jeff's stuff. Yeah. So that's yeah. So then, so when I left Syracuse, my body, like a third of my body of work in my portfolio was comic related. Okay. It was pages. Uh, so character. what moves you towards more of the uh, oil painting field? Because that's what you're known for. Yeah, but I was, you know, the catch was I was also a really good painter. Right. And the first, here, so the, the you know, this is the the pathways that c- probably could have happened. Right. right. So when I showed my portfolio, started started showing my portfolio, the first person who kind of gave me a chance was a book cover representative. Uh, mm-hmm. He was an illustrator who, uh, an art, a guy who represented cover illustrators, and he was looking for somebody who could do science fiction and fantasy because he was getting all these new commissions in that genre. That and, kind of seems to the path that uh, Frank Frazetta took as well. You know, like he was a comic illustrator for yeah. a while, his amazing comics, and now he's known for his amazing paintings. Amazing paintings, yeah. But I didn't even have a comics career. I didn't, I didn't even have a chance. <laughs> so it was like, you know, that first opportunity to get a job was to do book covers uh and that's what i worked for uh, i've made a couple sam like uh six samples for sal sal baraka was the guy's name and he broke he got me the first jobs and that led to the next job and the next and boom i was off being a book cover illustrator instead of doing comics 
did you want to do you want to write any of the stories as well or were you happy doing the illustrations no it, that's just it like the stories that i did were written by my friends so i never really wrote stories to illustrate so i was always kind of collaborating collaborating with other people uh, which also probably gave, made me very successful as a book cover illustrator because right. i knew how to negotiate that middle ground pretty well i was very comfortable playing in that middle ground well, there's that cliche that uh, a picture says a thousand words, you know, so yeah, yeah. if you illustrate it well, it, it tells a lot of story, you know, and a lot of the comic illustrators are, they're kind of not giving the credit I think they deserve because they really gave the look to it. If they were good illustrators, they gave yeah. as much to the story as the actual writer did. Yeah, they can be. Yeah, certainly. Like, uh, I, I, you know, I think comic illustration is certainly getting its recognition uh, more lately it's just a matter of i think a, another decade before we start seeing more like a museum show like right. that's what's sad is like comics are one of the greatest art forms of the 20th century and you don't see it you know you walk in the metropolitan museum you walk into museum of modern art and you don't you don't see comic pages on the walls right, they're, right. They're, they're, it's they're they're devoid of them uh, and so someday, I think someday we'll see those. They'll they'll, they'll be. Well, there. it's one of those things you got stereotype, like you know, like tattooing or like you know, rock music or anything else. It's like it, for a long time it had to fight away from the stereotypes and the cliches to get where it is now yeah. to be yeah. respected as an art form. Yeah. So, so yeah. So what got you into Lord of the Rings? Because that's what you're really you know really well known for. Because you do these amazing paintings for Lord of the Rings. No oh, thanks. Yeah, that that uh, Lord of the Rings kicked in just soon after I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So <laughs> there was a uh, look. I, I was starting to play D anD D, and my older brother Mike uh, was had just read a book for his English class at school, and he said, "Here, you might like this book," and it was The Hobbit. <laughs> and yeah, I liked it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I proceeded to read Lord of the Ring, you know, all three of the, you know, the, the Fellowship, the Two Towers, you know, the Return of the King. And, and I just was on a pathway to being an avid fantasy reader uh, after that. Was so. it one of those things where like, like when I read stuff, because, you know, I'm an artist and I picture how everything looks. I'm like, well, it should be like this. It should be like this. And, and like, I kind of create a world in my head about, you know, what oh, I what? think is going on. Up, uh, you know that's that's the power of Tolkien, is that he doesn't describe things. He right. doesn't get into physical descriptions. Like, you're, like if you try to find out what Frodo looks like, there's almost nothing. They, there's mentions of like hairy feet for all hobbits, <laughs> not not Frodo in particular. But the only one description of Frodo is that he's a, he has a cleft chin. Okay, and that's it. Like there's no other description. There's no descriptions of Mary or Pippin, none of Sam. You know, like there's 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 emotive things. Uh, you can't like Strider has is like dressed in brown and uh, and green. Or, or no, I think that was Legolas. And like like we don't we have no idea what Legolas's hair color was. Like what his face structure might be. Whether elves had pointy ears. Like none of this. Like Tolkien just doesn't describe this stuff. So it's a, as a as an illustrator, you can run with it. You can just go like, "Wow, anything is possible." Yeah. So, what did you basically like? What was your inspiration for the way things should look? Oh, well, certainly, I I grew up looking at uh, Alan Lee, John Howe, Ted Nasmith, Michael Garland, David Wenzel. <laughs> so these are uh, Tim Hildebrand, Tim and Greg Hildebrand, uh, Michael Kaluta. So these are all illustrators. That uh, were Mike Lewis is an amazing talent. I love his stuff, especially on The Shadow. Like, yeah, I don't yeah, think I like anybody that. did The Shadow as well as he did. Yeah, more comics, right? And, uh, <laughs> oh, and you know, the other illustrators like uh, Ian Miller, who mm -hmm. did like all this great black and white work. So basically, my point is also is that the world of Tolkien did not have a set vision. There wasn't anybody that you could say this is what it. This is what it is the best representation of that. So uh, I, rem I remember getting this book, uh, The Tolkien Bastiary, when I was a teenager, and it was edited by uh, David Day, and it had approximately 40 different illustrators who were okay. interpreting Tolkien's world. 
And Ian Miller was was one of that was was in them. Alan Lee was also in there. I think John Howe was too young, so he wasn't actually in that book. Uh, but that book set set it up so that I felt like my work could be plausible in Tolkien's world because there were you know the forty other people were doing visions of it stylistically very different realistic painting really almost abstract you know graphic representations and so as a young artist i i felt very comfortable playing you know making images out of tolkien's world what yeah. gave you the opportunity like uh what, what was the first uh the 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 first chance you had to kind of get into that world and start putting out illustrations oh oh wow uh boy let's see uh i mean as a professional it's actually probably my lowest level of quality <laughs> I've ever done for Tolkien. It's it's sad. It's like this is the truth. It's uh the uh Iron Crown Enterprises was a game company that was publishing a Middle Earth trading card game. Kind of like a spin, you know, after Magic the Gathering took off. So right. they, they had the Tolkien license and they were publishing uh Middle Earth cards. But the pay was horrible. It was like $150 a card. <laughs> uh, and they needed stuff really fast. Right. And they had style guides for what they wanted everything to look like. So I did I did a couple, like maybe a handful of nice cards. And then the most of them were really crappy, really bad pieces of art. Uh, so that was sad. I felt really like depressed a little bit about the quality of what I was Cause it was like a, it was like up and down. Like I do right. a good painting and then three really bad ones. And then maybe one good one. And uh, you also have the thing where like you do an amazing painting and they wouldn't reproduce it. Right. So you're like, hey, it looks so much better in person. Oh I don't no. Know what you did. No, no. I, I just sucked. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was just really some really bad pieces of art. So uh, it was no, no fault of the publisher really, except for the pay scale. So I couldn't. I didn't really have time. I couldn't spend time on any of these things. Well, uh, I know a lot of uh, comic artists complain about that, like these like impending schedules where it's like yeah. we need everything right now, and then you know they constantly edit and revise it, but yeah. not from an artistic perspective, more from a a sales perspective. And did you yeah. run into that? Yep. Yeah. No, that's that's truly what comics was, and 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 uh, you know my hats off to illustrators who can deliver quality under those kind of deadlines i mean it, it's just super impressive to see what some illustrators can do some artists can do and uh and so yeah that's but as a like when i got those middle earth cards i wasn't really good at managing speed so i was still like a slow oil painter and so i had not developed a style that collaborated with speed the necessary, you know, deliveries of speed. So, um, but I guess the reason why I want to point that out is that a few years later, I received the commission to do the cover of The Hobbit for David Wenzel's graphic novel. Uh, they were republishing that book, ba Ballantine Books was, and they contacted me about redoing a cover for that. And that's when I pulled out all stops. That's when... I like just went full on like Peter Paul Rubens Caravaggio like approach towards Lord of the Rings and that literally oh, I love Caravaggio I kind of love his story yeah. too it's like he did all this stuff that like kind of like pissed off everybody but it was so good they didn't dare get rid of him <laughs> yeah that's right right yeah the way he used uh really like prostitutes or models who weren't perfectly uh, you know uh, I guess approved by the church for well, you know, and he was gay. And back in the day, that was like a huge thing. Oh, like was, he would yeah. often sleep with like his models and stuff, and eventually get chased out of court. And then somebody else hired him because they're like, "Oh, he's so good, he has to work for us." <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's a trade off, right? He was just too, good. <laughs> that, and and doing something different too, right? With his lighting structures. Oh um, yeah, he's the inspiration of this day. I think. Yeah, it could, it could not be ignored. Yeah, that was it was ama amazing. So yeah, so Caravaggio is one of those uh, you know narrative realism illustrator you know, artists that I love to turn to for a bit of uh, you know tapping into for inspiration. Yeah.
Well, I remember, um, I think I read something about your journey when you first moved to New York and you didn't get a job immediately. So you're going to a lot of art museums, looking at the famous masters and kind of examining their work. Is that true? Oh, I mean, that started, yeah, that started even before I moved to New York. Uh, being at Syracuse University, I mentioned, you know, they had visiting artists come up to teach. And I then started making trips then to go visit the museums, go visit, like, what is New York? You know, you hear about it, right. and go to see gallery shows and really getting firsthand exposure to original works of art. And that that's, again, my my perception of, you know, there's you know, there's one thing to look at a, a reproduction in a camp, you know, in a in a book to see a, a painting. Another thing to see the original right. work of art, you know, oil painting or or acrylic or whatever water, whatever it was, uh, firsthand. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. My first couple, my first year here in the city was not quite first year, but uh, when I first moved here, the first six seven months, I didn't have like a regular job. Uh, and so I was spending time going to the museums, working part time at the Society of Illustrators and making samples for Sal Baraka as you know, that's when I was trying to start to trying to break into that book cover market. OK, yeah, I remember I read the uh, the Frank Miller Batman's. I thought that's what New York looked like. And I remember my art teacher saying, if you want to make a career, you have to move to New York. So <laughs> I moved to New York thinking it was going to be just like Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, it certainly is a night it's an interesting place huh right, right. So how long when how long did you live here or what like when well i i still live here now but oh. now i live out in long beach new york but okay. i moved Further to out. basically the city i moved to brooklyn and i moved to brooklyn in 98 okay and i remember there was a lot more of like a kind of artistic sense like i could get lost in the area side for like the entire day just looking at stuff <laughs> You know, yeah, right? you it's, can't really do that anymore. I don't think. Uh, I think you can. It's just you're looking at different things. There's there's certainly a a grittiness that's still here in New York. It's, right. It's changed. Uh, like I, I was just in Manhattan uh, two days ago, and it was like, wow, you know, it's not quite, you know, like I don't come in here as much. You know, the I, the 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 plate, you know, like you don't have to go for art supplies, you know, like, right. right. So I used to go in all the time to Pearl paint or New York right. central. Well, now you just go like online or yeah, everything. Right. And come to your house. Yeah. Yeah. Go. I used to go figure drawing down in Soho, uh, going yeah. to the society of illustrators, like almost like once a month, at least going to see a new show. So yeah, it's like definitely the, the vibe, but maybe, you know, it just might be age. <laughs> it's <just> like, <laughs> no, it's just it's probably just age because I think New York still has a lot to offer. It might be, but it seems like they had like I remember they had a bar called the Pharmacy, and it was a pharmacy that they made into a bar, but it still had like the medicine cabinets and everything. <laughs> so there's yeah. like lots of like cool stuff and like record stores. You could go downstairs; they have all used records and so on. Yeah, like that. yeah, that's true. Some of that. Uh, the but it sounds like an old man if I talk about all this stuff. Like back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, but it is, you know, you're right. There is some truth to that. Well, it's in a way that was like retail, right? I mean, a lot of these things that you can refer to, like sh the Strand books. Yeah, or, like, well, I, I remember that place. I, I right? do an album cover and I, I like I didn't have Internet. So I went there and I bought medical books because I had to draw like an autopsy. So I bought all these <laughs> medical books. So I had reference. Yeah, and that's yeah, the strand up until like maybe well about 10 years ago I really stopped using it as a, a like a go-to resource. Uh partly because the internet just took over everything. Uh, right, well now you can just put it in Google and you'll find, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Like a million pictures everything million, you need. Right. But I still love having like uh, like behind me you can probably see the wall of books. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those are strand book purchases there, used books. Uh things that again that in a way, they're nice because they also represent usually visuals that most people aren't tapping into. So if you do a Google search, right, you know, it's true. You know that's million, really true. A million other other illustrators are doing that too, right? Right. But but a book is like, like everyone just like, that same girl face. Yeah, like, that, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, watch out, watch out for that Afghan young woman. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even the AI is they are, they are Trump they are like knocking down and uh, right. copying that one. And they yeah. the trend, like whatever is popular, is like, well, this girl of this age, she has to have eyebrows like this. Yeah. You know, maybe she has to have an animal on her head. I don't know. That was a thing for a while. 
Yeah. You know, like, like it's all trends and, and yeah, yeah, that you, fills you want, up the majority of it. Yeah. As an artist, you want to walk the, you know, the path least taken in some way. Right. So, um, so that's in a way that's like part of my illustration career too, is like, like when I was getting in here, I saw that people weren't like some of the illustrators in the genre weren't embracing like a classicalism of, uh, I could call it that, like, you know, the Caravaggio Rubens right. aesthetic thrown into fantasy and science fiction. So I decided, oh, you know what? That can be a little niche of mine uh, that I can, like, really carve out. Like, you know, do a Van Eyck. Like, how would Jan Van Eyck uh, or Hieronymus Bosch do science fiction? Uh, and, like, Yeah, and, yeah. No, and, like, that's a good approach, yeah. Did you get some feedback? Like they're like, well, that might be artistic, but uh, commercially, this is what you need to do. Like I remember no, it, my yeah. first comic book interview, and the editor said, like he looked at my portfolio and goes, "This might work in art school, but let me tell you what sells." <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Luckily, no. I had the thing is that I I, I had Sal Baraka as my representative for eight years, and okay. so he really he was really a champion for me. Like he, he really was supportive. Uh, so he, and as a buffer as well to like, ne you know, negativity, negativity or criticism. So he, he really helped me, allowed me to grow underneath his, you know, his wings. So yeah, a big thanks to Sal for giving, you know, providing that chance for me to grow. So yeah, I, I didn't have people telling me like, ah, that's not what we want to see. I just, you know, I was able to just do it. And, and yeah, Sal. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So what what do you do now? Do you do mostly um covers? Do you do um I you teach as well, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly doing, let's see, probably like a 50 50, you know, Magic the Gathering. I've been mm -hmm. doing a lot of work with them lately, uh, because they're they're back doing like really good stories and, and things and giving a little more time on the execution of the works. And then I also do a lot of private commissions and my own personal paintings as well. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just completed a giant epic uh, Middle Earth landscape for a museum show down in Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yep. Are you kind of a, a go-to guy for like uh, certain uh, genres or whatever? Like if somebody does a new sci-fi book and they go, oh, you got to talk to Donato. He'll do this amazing painting for you or for Lord of the Rings or anything like that. Well, you think there are too many people out there at this point. I think there's all. Well, the thing is, I I don't. I haven't done. I haven't pursued. I should say, I haven't pursued doing a lot of cover work anymore. Okay. Uh, in a way, I like like if I'm gonna do my stories, like I'm I'm fine doing like Magic the Gathering as stories. But if I want to do something else, I find I I have my own like series of ideas, or I want to play in Middle Earth a little more. So I don't. Yeah, I haven't really wanted to do book cover illustration for quite a few years now even though i do still want periodically i do it i still get commissions here and there but i'm not pursuing it because i i have all this depth of stories that i want to do on my own even though i'm not writing them they, they they're there they're, they're kind of actually up on a wall over here uh, well like a good picture tells the story What's that? A yeah. good picture tells a story. Yeah, it does. Just the right? way you illustrate it tells a story. Right. And it, it's an implied story, which, yeah. is, which is enough to like satisfy me visually and thematically inside a, a composition. Yeah. Well, I think some of the best stories don't spell out everything, but they, they kind of give you impressions and, you know, right. you can kind of yeah. fill in what you need. Yeah. That's the ambiguity aspect of that. And I learned that quite a, uh, the power of ambiguity from an, another painter, uh, Vincent Desiderio, who I assisted with when I first moved to New York. So yeah, I should say, yeah, like while I was trying to you know break into the industry, I also was apprenticing with Vincent uh, in his studio. He's a uh, very incredible realist painter, oil painter, okay. uh, in the fine art world. And he, he, his images are all about ambiguity. They are you know narrative narrative ambiguity uh, with his 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 characters and. So that's yeah, that's something I certainly try to tap into now, more so as a uh, kind of more like a fine art, uh, science fiction, fantasy painter, uh, of, of letting that stuff hang out there and let you know, like you said, letting the audience complete the narrative, complete kind of fill in the blanks or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So did you kind of go in like cycles, like you were doing like Lord of the Rings for a while, and then you're doing this for a while, and you're doing that for a while? Like it seems like you've done pretty much everything. Oh no! It's 
like, like I'll, I'm juggling. Like I, I, I'll, I'll always, always got multiple projects uh, going. Like I've got a Lord of the Rings painting over there. I've got a couple magic cards down at my feet. Uh, I've got in my sketchbook uh, a couple of astronaut paintings I want to do. Uh, I've got sketches that I'm working on right now for my next robot painting that I'm going to be executing. <laughs> so, and then I've got a book cover commission and interior illustrations that I need to do for uh, Grim Oak Press. Okay. So all of, like <laughs> that's all. All that stuff is concurrent. I'm, well, I'm just... it's better to be too busy than not busy enough. Yeah, at least in my experience, you know? yeah, yeah, and and I think that's partly why I try to keep everything in motion and not like, like I probably could do like 100% all magic cards. If I just said, you know what, give me, give me whatever you can and I'll fill up my entire schedule. They probably would feed me that way, but I don't want to, like, I want to, I want to stay diversified. I, th I think all aspects of my work benefit from all the other aspects. So and you probably I, feel better... a little more inspired to do new stuff. As yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so when I go, when I get to do a magic card, I'm not feeling burned out. I'm feeling excited about it. Right. Like, I'm tapping into these other things. And and then I take that excitement and visual world building that magic does, and I can throw that into what I do with my robots. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's really, yeah, I think that diversity keeps me very inspired. And then, you know, going out, to Manhattan, go I go to see a, an exhibition, a new exhibition, a new show. Uh, okay. Fuels. I remember well. I was so disappointed when I first came to New York and I didn't know what to look at. So <laughs> I was just like, I'll just go to galleries. And someone, I remember yeah. one had like a, is a Volkswagen Beetle. It was like obviously from a junkyard. They spray painted it white and they had like some huge price tag on it. I'm like, that's not fucking art. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is art. It might not be what you want to buy. That's but true. That's true. I, I, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, it is. <laughs> but, but you know what? That that's the stuff I like. You know, sometimes those surprises can be, you know, like just you know, I, I've learned like art. You can enjoy art on many like many different layers, what right. levels, right? And so, if it's you know, even if it's nothing, I would want to hang in my house. It's like I, I want to see like why the artist made that choice, like right. wh why they do that, and and when you can analyze that's that that's that uh, you know painting you know deconstruction aspect of of learning is like you know when you get into like why they made that choice and you go like oh yeah I can see that or maybe I can use a little bit of that myself even if it's that color scheme or that perspective yeah. or the, yeah the, or or the idea of like reappropriating old technology. And, you know, that's what makes Star Wars so good, right? The original yeah. story, that, you know, that, that, that junk, right? By throwing beat up junk, the droids, right? The Jawas that collected junk, right? Yeah. That, like, Lucas gave flavor to that world. Right? Well, I think he really nailed it in that, that first, uh, the first trilogy, you know, because it seemed like he was like, like yeah, yeah, he was on point with that. He was trying to incorporate everything he liked in that, as opposed to right. getting feedback from the audience. Yeah, yeah, like or yeah, I don't. Who knows what happened? But certainly, <laughs> those, those, for me, those first two films. Well, are, Disney uh, buying uh, out—that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Disney, Disney, not all bad. They do some great stuff, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that was the right approach for Star Wars. But yeah, hey, whatever. Okay. Well, although I have, I've heard people raving about uh, is it Andor, the the new one. Uh, uh, I haven't seen that yet, but that's supposed to be. Yeah, real. I, I've seen that. There's a series called Andor. It, it's right. pretty good. Um, I've seen like a, I think like three episodes of it so far. It's pretty good. I mean, yeah. I, I like um, I like the Mandalorian a little bit better. The Mandalorian okay. feels like old school Star Wars to me. All oh, right, but, yeah, that but it's not bad. You know, so far yeah. it, it it has potential. I have to see more of it. Okay. Yeah. But so, wow. so right now, what you're working on mainly is like pet projects of your own, not necessarily you know assignments given to you, or like no. you, you're kind of pick and choose between assignments depending on how you like it. But you're well known enough so that you can you have that luxury. Yeah, kind of. Uh, like I, I don't, I don't really pursue clients right now. You okay. Know, I, I, I mean, almost like, you know, wait for the phone to ring, even though it's telemarketers <laughs> at his day. You know, wait, wait for the email to come in. 
Uh, and so I, I tend to. And they have a great uh, way to update the your website and like get you more social likes and you know, <laughs> views and so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you know, the thing is, I, I do advertise in a way, like I'm um, like constantly posting on social media with my new projects. So okay. I, I call it passive advertising, right? Where you're, you're just sending out information, and you know, whoever might feel attachment for a robot for my middle earth landscapes, then, you know, they know how to get a hold of me. They know that I'm available for commissions. I, you know, I keep my website up to date with all the new magic cards that I do. So they see that I'm com being commissioned. Right. So it's more, so I, I tend to do a very passive approach toward. Now, give us a shout out. What's, what's uh where can people look at your work? What's uh, I, I've been to your website, oh. but tell everybody what your website is. Oh, it's just uh Donato art arts.com so the spelling is always a good one so like if you just look up donato d-o-n-a-t-o -O, and we'll we'll put it up here arts. so everyone can see and they can see your progress yeah, yeah you can put it in there yeah yeah i mean you do it on you know twitter is donato arts instagram is donato arts the website's donato arts if you just type in donato arts uh in the google you'll you'll get a bajillion hits and my website's right up there <laughs> at the top uh so that's what, that's what I mean. I don't, I, I feel like I don't have to be too overly proactive at this point in my career to like, you know, pursue clients. So I'm, I'm really just also just happy making these other paintings for myself uh, and then just selling them as fine art, you know, Mark, you know, going to a few events or conventions in each year, mm -hmm. sharing the new pieces and connecting. With it was kind of hard with all the lockdowns. You can't go to conventions. You can't show yourself. Yeah, well, that's changed. That's uh, I went to New York Comic Con just uh, last month. Okay, and, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I was, I mean, that was crowded. It was packed. It was great. It was a great show. Yeah, yeah. I think I think people are glad to get out of the house now and see stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. One thing I really like is like you will show your in progress, like what you do, like how you construct a painting, like you show your sketches oh. and everything. Yeah. And and I know that you'll show stuff like this is a sketch for it. This is when I've like um like kind of uh like laid the foundation of the coloring, but it's right. not the full piece. And I think you have a little bit different approach than a lot of people do. Like you draw it on paper first. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yeah, mostly yeah. I like almost every like ninety nine percent of what I do is a uh, process oriented. You know, I start okay. with actually like this little wall here. Uh, are, are it's a wall of thumbnails okay and those are those are ideas waiting for a chance to be born into a final painting okay uh, so every every painting i do starts with that foundation and then i do a little larger drawing and then i get my models my references you know my ma background material whatever i need to fulfill a more complete drawing executed and okay. then i add color so it's like like it's comics. Right? It's like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm also serious. It's like, this is what comic illustrators do. They do a page layout. They do a rough. You know, it's true. It's like page, Walter right? Simonson was talking about that. And what he'll do is he'll actually like, he used to do this. He says he's changed his method a little bit, but yeah. it, it's similar, but like with a higher technological edge to it, but he'll take a, a small illustration. I'll draw a little thumbnails, everything. Yeah. And, you know, so he captures all the action and the motivation yeah. and you know, the flow and everything. The, the, the potential story, right? Yeah. Right. And then, then he'll put it on a projector and then he'll project it big. And then huh. he'll, he'll sketch on the paper what the, you know, what the projector is blowing up on there. So he, he gets like the, the feel and the flow of it. Yeah. And then wow. we find it. So I, yep. I thought that was a good approach. No, that's that. I mean, you know, technically we do things just a little differently that I do, you know, we, we between him and I, but it is the same pro it's the same conceptual process, right? Thumbnail design storytelling, then the solidifying of detail and structure uh, and then color, right. Gets added in. And once you, once you've got the balance and movement of your, your piece laid out, then I mean, and some people do work differently, right? And it's not saying that this is the way you, you know, I don't teach like this is the method that you should use. This is just one way. This is what works for me. And color for me is a, uh, like a veneer. It's like a icing on the cake, you know, after you do all this other stuff, then you right. can add color and like really like jazz it up and really push. Your you lay down the hard work with the illustration and then right. from there you, you bring it to life with the color. 
That's right. Yeah. So, and, and that's why I jokingly say it's like comics. It's like, you know, the black and white line work, the penciling, the inking, right. right? That, that goes this, this, the kind of visual development of what comics were back in the eighties and nineties is that's kind of, I still do that. That's my, my logic for image making. I think some people really don't capture that. And I, I think that's what gives yourself really that old school feel to it. Like it looks like you're really involved in the process of, of storytelling and then yeah. you colorize it as opposed to people that are just like, I'll put colors, I'll grab your attention. And it doesn't feel as firm. It doesn't feel as realistic. Well, there's different, yeah, there's different ways to make pictures, right? So certainly uh, I am an object oriented illustrator, or like a, a wire framer, so to speak. Like I like world building every element, you know, the background, secondary elements, costuming, clothing. Whereas someone who might more be more fluid with color is maybe playing on emotional structure or, or color right. fluidity and, and sensibility. So they, they end up transmitting a different feeling out of their There's work. some people that seem to have that abstract. They just kind of like, it, it It seems to like draw out something like to, to bring something to life in the abstract. And then they put something in the foreground that's more solid, but you can kind of see the background, even though it's abstract, it still kind of tells a story and makes the a environment. Bit, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just a different, it's a different kind of storytelling. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, to be you know, like, again, I'm, I'm preferencing uh, my, my, you know, or examining my preferences is like, I like the Haran Miss Bosch of like detail or, or Jan Van Eyck <laughs> of like detail. Every That's, that's why I like George Perez and John Byrne. Uh, I, and uh, like those artists were like, or Jeff Darrow, right? That those were like, those are the people I go to. I love looking at their, their imagery. And well, I remember I went to, um I went to Italy and I went to, um I believe it was El Domo and it was a, uh, you know, a famous museum and they had one painting and it blew my mind. Like they were really playing with perspective. So it was ah. the Napoleonic Wars is Napoleon and all of his generals on a hill and they were in focus and all the cavalry men in front of him and behind him were slightly out of focus. Oh. So your eyes were immediately drawn to the hill in the middle of the painting. Wow. Ah. I thought I thought that was genius. Nice. Wow. Do you yeah. play with focus in your paintings at all? Not not like that. No, not as uh, like a camera eye technical thing. Yeah. Uh, fo focus for me is just a, a decrease in contrast, but it still preserves a high degree of detail. Okay. So I'll, I'll control with lighting and you know the brightness or contrast, color saturations, but not structurally. I, I still think uh, kind of like that flatness of it's just you know an aesthetic thing. Like that, that's just me. Right. Well, I know everybody's different. As long as it works, it works. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That's, um, that's that's what style is, right? That's what yeah. <laughs> is what style is, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it would be like it'd be boring. Like if everything was a photograph, it'd be like boring as hell, right? Right. right. Who wants that? Yeah, I, I actually, I actually think like a little bit of style involved in it makes it much more dramatic than just a yeah. photograph. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, yeah. there are people that are like, oh, that's amazing. You can capture it. I'm like, I, I remember, I don't remember who it was. It's, it's a British illustrator, and he says he tries not to make his stuff totally photorealistic because wow. he's like that's what cameras are for yeah yeah right yeah if you try to do so certainly i was like chase you know in, in the early 90s right before there was photoshop and such that you know as illustrators we were chasing that photorealism uh, yeah like, yeah right well, that was a, that was the holy grail you know yeah well it was right and then <laughs> yeah. photoshop transform that and like oh where, where, yeah. where where's our grail like right. so but luckily i still you know i still chase it but not you know not as much uh at least for a book cover illustration i'm not like chasing it as much yeah well and i feel like uh i i like more traditional style artwork as opposed to digital artwork and some of the digital artwork it, it'll try very hard to mimic like the texture of like an oil painting or whatever, but yeah. I always feel slightly let down when I find out it's digital. So ah. it's like, it's so much easier, but it's almost like a cop out to make like the blends a little smoother, you know, <laughs> the, the white a little brighter, whatever. Yeah. It's, I don't, it's not quite a cop out. It's a, it's a wonderful tool. Right? <laughs> You're being nice about it. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be like, Oh wow. You know, it, cause you know, in a way I, I do, like tweak some of my covers for publishing. Like, yeah, let's right. give it a little punch. But, you know, it's mostly because it just, you know, I, I'm aware of like, okay, 
when it goes to print, you just you just want a little bit more jazz. But when you see the an original painting, sometimes you want more subtlety. Sometimes you don't want it to be so graphic, right? Uh, you know, as as an art form. So like, I'm I'm happy to not like transform my pieces into really highly graphic paintings just because that's what I think the publisher wants. I, I'm, I'm trying to walk a middle ground with what I'm doing. Well, one art. thing I've learned is you have to kind of like make the artwork fit what it's going to be applied to. Right. Like if it's a book cover, it's going to have this giant book title on it. It's going to have the author yep. credit. Yeah, so you have to yeah. little space. So you have to move stuff out, out of, you know, the, the main frame or whatever, just so everything fits. So, so the end product looks good. Yeah. That's part of like, yeah. Right. So that's, uh, you know, that is part of being that collaborative process that I talked about, like being a good book cover illustrator is being sensitive so that you do leave room, you accommodate for those kind of design issues. Uh, and I, that's what I kind of get at is like, you know, if I have a painting that has too much contrast in those areas, yeah, I'll sometimes decrease it down to make right. it a little easier. Well, you know, it's also you, you paint very large and when it's shrunk down to print size, it looks almost like a photograph. But can, like, yeah. like I remember you did like a sci-fi painting and it's like a guy in like a like a like a astronaut suit and like his arm is like this and you see a gleam on it. Do you see it in real life? Like you see like the illustrative spots on it, like the, right. the whites and yeah. stuff like that. But when it shrunk down to book cover size, you're like, it looks like it gleams, it looks like it's Photoshop. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, it just all those little edge uh you know, brush strokes modulations are gone yeah. like you just blow up and that that you know that's part of like trying to be that photo realist like i mentioned you right. know, as a book cover illustrator yeah well do you do everything a little bit bigger than the size is going to be published at or the oh, size yeah, is going to be produced at yeah always yeah i'm, I'm usually working three to four hundred percent up from okay so again this is like hard copy published sizes so <laughs> uh you know the, i mean yeah because it like so many things are digital now like uh like you know, magic cards, some of them are pure, just purely digital cards that are coming out. So they right. don't have a physical representation anymore, even in print. Yeah, like the, the world is changing. Yeah. Well, I also noticed, I, I remember, in, in like it seems like there's almost a debate in this. Like some people are like, don't ever use solid black except for like in a couple, you know, minor spots. And some people are like, no, use it all the time. And I remember when I originally do a painting, like, First, I would sketch it out, you know, in um in pencil, but then I would use like watered down black. Well, I I'd use serpentine in black, but you know, okay. watered down black, right. like kind of right. illustrated as like a black and white illustration. And then I bring it up, and I remember who I maybe it was Patrick Jones was talking about his process, and he uses sepia tone instead of ah uh, pure yeah. black. Yeah, so it, it never goes fully dark, right? He right. always keeps a certain amount of luminosity. Right. What and then he only uses a little bit of black on the final product to make some stuff really pop. Yeah. Yeah, and I know I, I use black all the time here and there, but now you know, like almost never really use it as a pure structure. No, okay. so it's never just like 100% black unless I'm really going chasing after something really dark or really, really massive. So yeah, I actually I do use very little black in my, <laughs> uh, you know, in my work. That's kind of the illusion of space, you know. Like if you, you know, even like looking at this photo of me, you know, in Zoom here, right? Uh, like there's like under here, like the shadows is black, but not pure black. Yeah, yeah, but not purely. You know, I I would paint that with a bit of a warm glow, right? right. As a, like a painter, like if you see it in real life, there's almost no true black unless right. you're in like a dark cave or really high contrast light structures. So well, I remember my art teacher was like, he was getting down in paint. He's like, they make the blacks look blacker. They flatten everything out. So, you know, yeah. that's where it really helps to like draw from life. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. That, that sensibility, seeing the subtlety of, of nature and color edges. Yeah. I used to go life drawing all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, really like that's in my early part of my career, I'd go probably once, usually about twice a month at least sometimes three to four times, depending on my schedule. So right. I, I was going all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always, I, I feel like you can always learn, like you'll be 80, yeah. you can still yeah. learn, you know? Um, so you, you teach right now is it, do you teach me in the art students is a more advanced oh. program. Uh, yeah. I, I used to teach at the school of visual arts for about mm -hmm. 20 years uh, that in an undergraduate 
class there for science fiction. Isn't that where uh, Bern Hogarth is from? I'm not sure. Oh, boy, that would have been a long time ago, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, I, I, but I think he was the first person that did that because it didn't really exist. But it's like that dynamism they use in comic books where like people are like more forward, more back, you know. Like yeah. so, they had to kind of invent that, like the the whole cone and ball system. Yeah, the like, perspective, perspective stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, but uh, but I now I teach uh, I teach online uh, okay. class, so that's uh, it's just once a kind of once a uh, once a week uh, for three hours, kind of like a regular uh, college class, and it's science. It's just basically the same class, but I'm since I'm online. I can work with people all around the globe. Like I have uh, artists from, uh, let's see, Thailand and uh, Germany right now in my okay. class, and and then Americans as well. So it's just like really, we got a really broad amount of people joining in. From well, from I'd all. imagine your work makes it you know all over the globe at this point, especially with like social media. You know, people yeah. can see what your work looks like. So do they, you know, the people coming into it, they've seen your work previously and they really appreciate it. They want to learn like from one of the masters. Oh yeah. I mean, that's why they're taking a class. It's because it's from me. So, uh, and that's why I enjoy, <laughs> well, because, because they're, they're, they're motivated. They want to learn storytelling. They want to learn realism. Um, so it's really nice to get a, you know, a really super dedicated and focused group of artists together. And it's small. I, I keep I cap it at eight people, so okay. it's not a large classroom. It's really small, very intimate. Lot lot more discussion and feedback. Well, um, if people want to get, if they want to get advice and they want to get teaching from you, how would they get hold of you? How would they find you? Well, that's uh, you can email me. It's on my website. Okay. Uh, this class that I teach is with the, the Smart School, and that's also listed on my website as well. So if you do, also if you type in the smart school dot com, uh, no, I, th- I think it's the smarter art school. I, uh, the, the, <laughs> we'll, we'll put a link we'll, in there. We'll find it. We'll put it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. 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 But but it's like again, I own and there's other artists that teach like Greg Manchez, Dan DeSantos, Scott right. Fisher, uh, Cynthia Shepard, Ray right. Bonilla. So there's there's like about eight of us that teach uh, on a, a, a like kind of a once a class, once a week kind of session with that. Well, I, I remember, like you know, I took I read as well, and I took uh, like uh, uh, like it was like a BBC um, like online course session from Alan Moore, and you know everything he talks about, you can just like basically watch his like six hour video. Oh you know, wow! Um, yeah, I would imagine with an art teacher, he needs to kind of look at your stuff and say, "This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to work on." Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the, the the classes I do are they're not they're not recorded. They're all live. They're interactive. Uh, I critique. I do workovers digitally. So people will email me files, and I'll you know even though I'm not a digital illustrator, I'll you know work on them, talk about color, right. composition, story. So it's all it's well, very. I imagine it would apply. Like you might not know exactly what keyboard button to hit, but yeah, yeah, it I'm applies. Yeah, with yeah, but but you know it's enough <laughs> to communicate, right? And, and it gets yeah. a, a point across. So it really helps out. Yeah the students well, with that. I remember my art teacher, like one thing that I don't know if you've encountered this, hopefully you haven't, but people would bring stuff in and he would say something about like the anatomy or the light source or something and say, Oh, well that's my style. And he's like, no, if you look at like Picasso, he knew all the rules before he broke them. So you kind of have to know the rules to break them. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I think as I, 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 yeah, I've learned how to like, yeah, as a teacher, I've seen a lot of different styles. And, <laughs> and yeah, it's learning like, okay, what is your, what are you trying to do? That, right. That's usually what I usually ask the artists and like, okay, this is where it's effective. This is what you can improve on. Uh, certainly because there's, there are quirky st- drawing styles, right? right? And that's part of a visual language that an artist can develop. Like, like Walt Simonson in a way, right? right? Stylizing or Bill Sienkiewicz, right? Doing exactly. his, yeah, he's right? a huge. I'm huge fan of his stuff. Uh, yeah, or like right? Sam Keith, who did like the Max. You know, he right. exaggerated everything, but he definitely has an artistic style. That's right. So that so there's like right. So <laughs> so it's not about being photo real. It's just being like, what is your intent? How are you trying right. to communicate? And let's analyze that and let's take a look at it. So I think that again, that's being open to finding like that. The, like I mentioned about like fine art. It's even in comic art, like. What is the artist trying to do? How are they trying to communicate? 
And when you can find that groove or find that essence about the artist, then you can probably enjoy their work better, uh, really, and, and dive in and really go on that journey with them, with what they're doing. Well, everything I see of yours looks like there's a story behind it. And I always want to, like, even if I do, like, a straight-up painting for, like, a book cover, and they say, do whatever you want, which it doesn't happen enough, but I wish I had more. But they say, do whatever you want. You know, I still try and, like, tell a story, or at least in my head I have a story when I do the illustration. Yeah. Do you do the same thing? Because it, it seems like oh. a lot of your stuff has, like, a story behind it. Oh, 100%. Like, uh, I mean, again, that, that part, part of what I came out of doing a lot of book covers, Dan, is that it, it just... Yeah, you had to tell a story, right? I mean, that's right. the point of doing a book cover. But as I'm doing even other pieces, I'm, you know, like, how do I layer in an, an implied story? Like, if I'm working on this, or even, you know, like magic, sometimes magic has a sort of a simple theme to the concept, but it's like, okay, I want to add something else in there. I want to give a little more, more depth. And so I, I find little ways of weaving more cultural artifacts again again that's all from the stories i like to tell you know the movies that we're talking about I and mean, everything like that i love about great science fiction and fantasy is about this holistic world building right uh, and, and integrated structure of character when you do a, like a book cover or like a like a game cover or whatever do you read into it like if it's a book do you read the book or you read oh, a yeah. portion of the book no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like the book cover, of, like I'm, I'm doing now. It's a a novel where we're doing six interior illustrations and a cover. So, okay. like reading the entire book. And oh, then, that's uh, awesome! I wish more people did that. The interior illustrations. I think yeah. that really brings it out. Well, it is, yeah, and, and that's that's part of, part of the new wave of I mean, with some of the costs coming down for color printing. No, you know, okay. in general, right? They can do this. Yeah, it's more possible that you can okay. do these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that really gives it a feel. Um, <clears throat> but it, like whenever the um, whenever I do like a magazine cover, they'll send me a story. They're like illustrate something out of this story, and it always used to bother me as a kid when I buy a book because it's an amazing cover and you read it and nowhere is that cover present <laughs> in the book. You're like uh, nobody looks like that. <laughs> you know, that yeah, didn't happen. That Right, that that's part of the uh, editor's problem, right? They, they might have just bought, they just probably bought a pre-existing painting from another right. artist and slapped it on because it looked good. And those days are very, uh, those are rare now. Like, right, there's there's so many artists who are willing to tell stories, right? And to right. illustrate. I don't, I don't think that's an issue as much now. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a big Presenta fan, but I remember reading. Right. Um, I've read all of his books, and he had. Uh, one of his books you talk about, like, I don't even read the stories. I just do what I think would be good painting. <laughs> like, some of the paintings are nothing like the like, story. Yeah, that's right. That was, <laughs> it was that, that was the early days of marketing. And, uh, yeah. right, that's the power of also what he was doing and breaking right. the traditions. So people were just, it doesn't matter. Well, he could do almost anything and people go, dude, it, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing painting, <laughs> right? Yeah, that, that's what it was. It was about sales, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, um, how can people look at yourself? Are you selling into your originals? Um, you know, uh, are you selling prints? I, I know I bought a couple of um you, you had like these slim books like full of your um like yeah, illustrations, those, uh, like almost portfolios and um yeah, and I, I know calling you up and, and like you actually answered. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't I don't you know, I, I do have uh I got my my big middle earth tome from Dark Horse. Okay. Uh I think it still might still be in print or it might be close to being out of print, but you can find usually used copies. Uh, and uh, on my website, I've got print like uh, hundreds of prints, mm -hmm. originals, drawings. If there's, yeah, I think there's a couple of drawings still available there. Uh, but that's all through my website, the donatoarts.com website. Uh, and there's, I usually, I try to keep modestly up to date with news in there. And the galleries, mm -hmm. are, I keep up to date with all new artwork. So you can always see new stuff there as well like what you're working on what are you up to at this moment yeah kind of like the new the, mostly what i'm not what i'm working on i usually just wait until i've got finished pieces to share okay. uh, there, are, there are there's technique videos on my website there's the you know the technical stuff there's a draw there's like galleries with hundreds of drawings if you want to look at how my process is there so it's um, yeah, no, yeah, I, I recommend that yeah because yeah. i thought it was huge help 
You know, oh, yeah. they're, they're stuff where like, you don't even know how to approach it. They're like, well, um, I removed the seat from my toilet bowl so I could draw this curve. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. well, I guess you got to improvise sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, ba- the bathtub painting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, thank you very much for doing this. Uh-huh. I really appreciate it. Do you have anything else you want to give a shout out to or have people um, take a look at? No, not real. I mean, it's just been been a pleasure talking with you, Dan. Uh, you know, sharing my passion and uh, <laughs> you know, and, and just having a great chat tonight. Yeah. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you very much, man. All right. Have a good night. Goodbye, you everyone. Too.